And then he takes my arm and takes off my gold watch and my jewelry and he puts them away. And I'm wondering, I'm going, okay, maybe it's because, uh, so I don't lose them in the hospital. Then he starts taking off my clothes and I'm going, okay, now he's changing me to dry clothes before he calls the ambulance so that I'm nice and clean. Well, he took off my clothes and to my surprise, he went over me and he started raping me. And I couldn't figure out what the heck he was doing. Like, who rapes a paralyzed woman? It didn't make sense. Like, that's not how we, we do things. Uh, and then he got up when he was done and went and took a shower and I could hear him in the shower. And I'm in the middle of the bed, lying there naked and then I could hear a more heavier flow of water. And as if he was, excuse me, now filling a bathtub. Excuse me. And he came around and he's trying to carry me off the bed to take me, um, I guess, to take a bath. And as he pulled me off the bed, he dropped me. And he goes, you're too heavy, I can't carry you. And he dropped me, I fell on my side and just limp, sitting there and I can't move. Um, and I'm just wondering, why isn't he calling 911? What the heck is he doing? Um, and to be honest, this was a good time for me to realize it was nice to be heavy and a little bit chubby. It was like the first time. Good advantage. <laughs> it was a good advantage. Um, and then he left. Uh, I think I remember Colleen started, it was Saturday morning, so you can hear her TV on. So he ran out of outside the room and she told me later that he got her cereal and he told her mom is in bed crying over her brother and took several Xanaxes and doesn't want to be disturbed. So Colleen respected that and didn't come in. Yes, for not a single moment from the beginning, he showed any surprise for you being paralyzed. So, no. No. okay, yes, continue your story, but it's interesting yeah. not to yeah. realize, no. never. Yeah, nothing. And then I'm lying there and all of a sudden, I feel ice cold water being poured on me all over my paralyzed naked body. And that put me in shock. It, I didn't realize how uh, cold water to a body like that, it made me feel like there were nails going throughout my whole body. And as I was feeling the nails, the comforter is telling me it's an annoyance shot. It will pass. This it will pass. And he's comforting me to 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 endure. He's saying it will pass. It will pass. And I'm lying there, and I see a vision. On the as I'm on the ground, I see on the ground next to me a hand, and it was Jesus's hand. And it was where they were piercing him with the nail with the hammer. And that's all I could see how they were piercing him. And when I saw that, my pain was trivial. Having ice water cause me nails. It was like, how dare I complain or not be able to take that pain when Jesus endured a much higher, like, can't explain it. Sure. So it, it made me endure my own discomfort and shock. 
and just waiting for it to pass and and just waiting for it to pass and then it stopped and uh, it was good when it stopped but he left the room came back five minutes later brought I don't know how big of I don't know what he had in his hand that had so much cold water ice water and again he started pouring it on me and I, my body went in shock again and it was torturous uh, at the moment yeah. you were on the floor on your bedroom on, on the, the floor. floor on the bedroom between the bed and the the window and okay. I'm crumbled on my side so I'm crumbled okay. naked on the floor. And he's doing this pouring of the cold water on me. And I'm going, why is he calling 911? What, what is he doing? And this pain was, again, uh, thank God I had the comforter. And he kept saying, it will pass. It will pass, shot. It will pass. And again, I saw Jesus' hand. And that comforted me and I was able to endure. And having the comforter there coaching me through it, it was okay. It didn't matter what was happening to me. And then he stopped, he ran out of water and left. And I'm sitting there lying, trying to figure out what is going on? Why isn't he calling? And then he comes in and he steps over my body and he bends down and he takes my nose and he holds it shut like that. And he held it shut and remember, I'm paralyzed so I can't breathe from my mouth. So my mouth is blocked and yeah. now he got my nose shut. You're paralyzed. I, what's up? Yes, you're paralyzed. So I'm paralyzed. And, and now this is the only air supply in my nose. And he's holding it for a very long time. And suddenly my mouth opened up. I went oh! like that as a reflex. And as soon as I did that, he let his hand go. He, he, I think I startled him and he walked away. And this is when I, re I remembered my life insurance. I had a million dollar life insurance. Half of it was going to him and the other half was going to my children. And I didn't get a chance to cancel it. And that's when I realized what he's, what is he's doing. So he comes back and he does the same thing again. And he holds my nose tight and he holds it as long as he can. And again, my mouth opens up and he lets go. Uh, as soon as I went oh, like that and he, he left. And then he came in a third time and stepped over my body again. And he held my nose tight, but this time he decided to shut my mouth. So he went like this and he put his three fingers gently over my mouth. So he held the nose and covered my mouth and I couldn't breathe. There was no air supply. My lungs were shutting down. It was, it's, it's hard to explain how you feel when you have no air and you can't breathe. Um, but as soon as he was doing all this and I'm in the discomfort and pain, I realized this is it. I'm done. There's no way out of this one. And as I realize that I'm dying, I see Jesus' hand, but this time he's standing, but I can only see up to his knees. He had a robe on and he had his hand offered to me like this, as if he's receiving me, escorting me to the other mm -hmm. side. And I'm looking at him and I knew he could remove this guy's hand. 
I knew he could stop the whole thing, but I didn't want to. At this point, I wanted to go with Jesus. I didn't want him to leave without me. And I didn't want him to stop the process. I just wanted to go. And I did. And Daniel, there was no, when you die, you don't feel an end. You don't feel like, oh my God, I just died. It doesn't work that way. You just keep on going, but you look back and you see your body and it's like a heavy coat that you took off. But there's no end, like, and there's no darkness. There isn't like, okay, now I'm dead, now, no. You just keep on going and it's, it's your soul that keeps on going. Your soul isn't dead. It's the body that got dead. So the soul just continues. And I kept on going. And I saw beautiful white clouds. That's what I remember the first thing I saw. And they were opening up gently, slowly, slowly, and revealing a beautiful blue sky like uh, we see the sky blue, but this time it was like sharp, blue, beautiful. And I'm looking at the sky and around the sky, there were these big animals flying. And these big animals, I had never seen animals like that. And they had uh, the colors that they had were colors I, I never saw before, just incredible colors, large animals, with wings flying around the sky. And then I found myself standing at a, like a meadow, a beautiful greenery. And at the end of it, I could see they're preparing and they're rushing for a wedding. And I could see a bride, but her back was to me. She was like, and I could tell she's a bride. And I'm, I remembered in the Bible, it said that when we die, we become um, brides of Christ, something like that. So I thought, that's me, that's my wedding. But I wanted to go look to see who is that bride. I wasn't sure. I wanted to go and look at her face and see, is that me? Who is it? And I rushed towards her, but I missed her. And I came to uh, a door where I entered and it was a corridor and I kept on walking. And as I'm walking to the side, there was this majestic chair and there was a lady in it, but she was covered in a veil. So I couldn't tell who she was and I wanted to see her. And I'm walking and I'm trying to look and, and get a peek of her face to see who she is, but I couldn't. The veil covered her. The veil was her, over her and the whole chair. And um, right away, I saw somebody standing there. And I asked him, I said, uh, who is she? And he said, she's the purest of all. And I just kept on going. And I came to a gate or a door, and I saw a body of light. And that body of light was my mom. She had no features, just light, but in a body form. And immediately I recognized it was my mom. And we didn't embrace, but it just, the overwhelming joy you see your mom after all these years. And she took me in and my sister Nadia came out to greet me as well. And Nadia was another body of light, but she was taller because mom was shorter. And again, no features, but right away, I knew it was Nadia. And what was beautiful about that, Daniel, is Nadia had committed suicide. 
at the age of 35. She had gone through tremendous depression, and especially after my father. My father had been killed in a car accident and she was very close to dad. And then she had really bad marriage and just fell in a horrible depression and, um, and took her life. But I never knew where she went because you know, in church, they tell you if you commit suicide, it's murder. So I was always worried. She wanted to go meet Jesus. I remember uh, we the last conversation I had with her. She said, I want to go meet Jesus. But I didn't realize that's what she meant. And she was in heaven. And to me, that was the most amazing thing, knowing that my sister is in heaven and she's good and that our Father in heaven, God, is a very compassionate God, and he doesn't judge us the way we judge others. He recognized that she went through an illness, and she wasn't in her right mind. She wasn't murdering herself just to spite God. She was in tremendous pain, and when you're in a deep depression, there's just no pill to get you out of it. No. And uh, sometimes you just want to stop the pain. And she did just that. But it was amazing to see her there. And I walked with her. She took me into a room and I'm following her. And now I'm complaining. I'm going, Nadia, this is too much. I can't. This is too much. I became overwhelmed with joy. I had so much joy, I didn't know how to contain it. And I'm complaining now to my sister is, I don't know what to do with it. It's too much. I can't handle it. It's too much. And uh, she said, Anna, with Jesus, it, it just keeps on getting better. And I'm going, how can it get better than this? And just that joy you feel, which like keeps escalating. You know, in life, we have some joy, happiness, it's up and down. We, our lives are never up there all the time. But in heaven, it's like, it keeps on getting better. It's like, you, just when you think it's not going to get better than this, it, it gets, gets. Better. It gets better. It gets better. And it's like, you're going to blow up. Like I felt, I just didn't know what to do with it. It's just too much. But somehow, I guess we know how to contain it when we get there. And when she told me that, she walked me out, and then my father was there. And um, <laughs> he also was a body of light. And it was amazing to see him. It had been a long time. He had died in 82, and this was 2009, so it was a long time. And like I said, he had died in a car accident. I had never gotten over my father's car accident because I always pictured, he had a collision face to face with the huge uh, semi, I don't know what you call it, like big trucks, that moving mm -hmm. rock. And they hit face to face, like a collision. Mm -hmm. And he had, he was with his driver, the chauffeur, and he, the chauffeur got killed of course too. And I always pictured my father with the last minute and the pain he may have endured. And it was just, I would cry so hard every time I would remember and I would relive what he went through. Sure. Seeing him there was just amazing, Daniel. It was just a beautiful reunion with your loved ones. And I was just standing there with them enjoying them. Now we're not talking, but we're communicating. You call it telepathy, I don't know what you call it, but we're communicating. And then Nadia says, come on, hurry up. We have a banquet with Jesus. And I'm going, what? Did you just say a banquet with Jesus? Like she said it so casually, you know, like, we're gonna go eat with the neighbors. Like, and and I just I was in awe. Oh my <laughs> lord, gonna go see Jesus. Like 
it's like he's <laughs> you can just do. too and good to be true it was it was like <laughs> what oh and then they started going and stupidly or i guess it wasn't meant to be i didn't follow them i didn't follow them and i found myself in that going into another room and then in that room at the end of the room excuse me sure i could see the late pope the late coptic orthodox pope his name was pope kirollos he was a very humble loved pope just down to earth spiritual simple just i had never met him but he was there and what's strange is i could see him i don't know how but he was in a body of light i could see his body clothed in something because i remember his hair and his hair was gray but he didn't have a lot of it like i could tell he didn't have a lot of it and i'm walking towards him and he's looking at me and he's going where have you been child where have you been <laughs> and i'm looking and i'm going is he talking to me? Uh, <laughs> and i felt like a little child and i'm going uh well i i i haven't been going to the coptic church but i've been going to calvary and he goes why child why and i go well i i didn't encounter much you know compassion there especially after i married the muslim what do you expect so i'm telling him i didn't find compassion there so i went to calvary and he looks at me and he goes what is your name child in a rhetorical question like and I tell him my name, and my name in Egyptian means compassion. And he looked at me and he goes, you're looking for compassion outside, but you are what we need inside. Hurry up, child, hurry up. There's not, no time, there's not enough time. Run, run, go. And he kicked me out. And he just rushed me out of where he was and as I'm leaving, I guess I'm leaving heaven. Or, and then I see a face being revealed to me. And the face was being revealed in a very slow manner. So like I could see, um, like it, it was like this and it's slowly, you know. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, from the head and slowly over the nose. For, and then the face, the, the lips. And as he's revealing himself, I remember noticing his long nose. And it was Jesus' face. I recognize him, but he didn't look like Jesus of Nazareth with blue eyes and uh, light hair. He looked more like a Middle Eastern Jewish you know, olive skin, um, brown, dark eyes. And his features, he was not pretty. He was not a pretty boy. He was just a man, um, not as handsome as Jesus of Nazareth that I always pictured. And when I think of Jesus, that's the image I see. So I'm seeing him and I'm thinking, he, he doesn't look as him. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God. He's, but I'm taking the awe of him. But still, stupidly enough, I'm thinking about how handsome or not so handsome. And then I'm, I don't want to think that way because I know he knows what I'm thinking. And I didn't want to embarrass him. And I'm trying to just stop the thought in my mind to not, you know. And... Uh, and then I found myself, I must have left, and I was, my body was just looking over the freeway in California here. We have the five, what we call a five, and the 405, and they come together, and we call that the Y. 
and I'm looking down on traffic, really bad traffic, and the world looked very dry compared to where I was. And then right away I was in my bedroom and I could see Sam on the bed and he brought me up somehow, he carried me and he's holding me as he lies, lays down, as he's down. And I get into my body and instantly I jump out of his arms because I couldn't handle him touching me. And I'm right in front of him. I stand up at the edge of the bed and I'm naked and I didn't care. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and you can just imagine what he's thinking now. It's like, uh, I wish I did have a camera or a film to just capture that look for him to see somebody that he just thought he killed and got away with the money. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at him, but I couldn't talk. And I'm trying to get him to leave. I'm just like, I'm, now I'm so disgusted of him and I want him to get out of the house. I know my daughter is next door. I don't know how long I'm staying. At that point, I wasn't sure, am I coming back temporary or am I back? I thought maybe I'm coming back to say goodbye to Colleen, maybe to scare the heck out of him, but I didn't know how long I'll be. So I'm trying to get him to leave the house and he's refusing and he's going, no, come, come. And he's telling me, come, lie down, just calm down. And because I couldn't speak and I'm, I'm like doing charades and I showed him that I saw what he did. So I acted it out. I said, you, I know you, I can see you. You did this, you did. I played it out for him. So he knows that I saw, I felt, and I, I was there. He probably thought that I was unconscious just because I was paralyzed. He thought I was unconscious and exactly. didn't know what happened. And I was telling him this and he kept saying, okay, fine, just, just come, just come down. You know? And I said, no, I kept saying no. And then as I'm standing there, I'm also trying to leave evidence because I'm, like I said, I didn't know if I'm leaving or not. And I'm trying to leave my fingerprints. And I remember seeing his glasses on the, the where the mirror was. And I grabbed his glasses and I'm putting my finger, uh, um, I can't print. Oh, print. I can't think. my fingerprints on it just to show struggle so that when the police comes and if I'm gone, if I'm dead now, uh -huh. that yeah. there was a struggle. We didn't just make realize it what really happened. Yeah. Right. So evidence and he's thinking I'm breaking his glasses and I'm going that idiot. But I'm doing all this and um, he's not um, getting out. And then he's threatened to go to Colleen's bedroom. And when he did this, that's when I realized there's danger here. So I tried stopping him and he pushed me away and he went into her room and I went running after her. Again, I'm thinking maybe I'm still in spirit. I don't know. Uh, as soon as I walked behind him, Colleen saw me and I was naked. And she saw me and she got startled. And she goes, mom, what happened? So as soon as she saw me, I ran back to, the, to my bedroom and she ran behind me. And I told her, shut the door. And she heard me. So that was the first time I was able to speak. So she shut the door, she brought me a robe and uh, she calmed me down and I, I laid down on the bed and he, I guess he went to the living room. And then so much happened after that, Daniel. It's just, it was crazy after that. It's amazing, your story. Oh, well, 
there are many, many, many different lessons that if we pay attention to your story, we will learn a lot, a lot. Uh, well, I have some quick questions to yeah, you. I know questions. that you've been talking for a long time I, now, I, I, and you must be tired, and thank you very much for that. No. Uh, but some, some, some questions first. Uh, so I believe that uh, everybody realized that uh, he was poisoning you for some time at that time. And uh, tell us a little bit about this. What, after all, when you realized that what had happened, okay. that when he poisoned you, how he poisoned you, and what, what meant that yogurt at that day with the Holy Spirit, when, no, okay, you decided to, to, to eat something different or less, or with yogurt. So tell us a little bit about it. Okay. So after the event, of course, well, so much happened and the police came and, you know, and uh, he played Mr. Innocent and he claimed that I was a crazy woman. I have, I had a nervous breakdown because I was managing three entities as a chief and they, and there was no evidence of uh, murder or anything. I came back. Uh, the ambulance, when they brought the ambulance, the ambulance said, this lady is as strong as a horse. And they didn't want to do anything with me because there was nothing to show that there was any attempted murder. And the kids also knew that he loved me. Like when I said he tried to kill me, the kids were going, oh, they thought I am having a nervous breakdown and mommy's losing her mind. Uh, so the police picked up on that. So they took me to a hospital, and then from there, they took me to a mental hospital to evaluate me. Um, and I stayed there like for <laughs> nine days. And um, when they, they finally realized they made a mistake, and they took me out, they sent me home, and we came home, I, we kicked him out. And the whole family came, of course, to see what happened. And I was trying, I went and I did a, a scan for my brain. I didn't know what caused the paralysis. So at this point, I didn't know what he did. And I'm thinking maybe I got a stroke and that caused the paralysis. And um, he realized that I'm going to be paralyzed. So he finished me off. That's what I was thinking, that mm -hmm. he just got tempted to finish me off rather than taking care of uh, a paralyzed woman. And he benefits the million dollars. So I went for a scan. There was nothing in my brain. I went for a heart scan. I thought maybe I got a heart attack. There was nothing. Everything was coming in clean. Then when I shared with my brother, and it took me a while to talk about what happened. You know, at the hospitals, I didn't mention anything about the, the after the near death or else I'd be locked up until today. If I had said I heard the voice and the, they would have kept me. Um, in one of the times I was telling my brother that he raped me before he did this, my brother picked up on, wait a second, this is not a coincidence. Raping you means he was trying to put evidence to show that we were good together and maybe you overdosed uh, I think his plan was to drown me in the bathtub and keep putting Xanaxes in my mouth and say that I dozed off crying over my brother and I fell asleep and I drowned. I think that was his plan. And But when we realized, wait a second, he was setting this up, then there is more to it. And of course, during that time also, I, uh, Paul, remember Paul, Colleen's yes. dad? Yes. He took advantage of this situation to get Colleen back. And he went and took her in court and said that her mother went to, she's crazy. She's in a mental hospital. She walks around the house naked. She's not fit to be a mother. And he took her from. Her. And that just broke me. Like that was taking her at the worst time ever. I needed her. Um, 
so I needed to prove to because now I couldn't see my daughter without uh, a visitation, without supervision. Mm -hmm. That I wasn't fit to see mm -hmm. my daughter. My son was older, I think 16, so he was okay. So I needed to prove to the judge that I was a victim. This is not, I didn't bring a crazy man or I wasn't crazy. Uh, so my lawyer said, Anna, go get a forensic hair analysis. Let's see what happened to you. Thank God, Daniel, that for the first time, I did not bleach my hair after the incident. Like usually I bleach my hair and I back then I did highlights. Now it's just almost gray without any bleaching. But back then I would do highlights. If you bleach your hair, it kills all the evidence. Like there's no, you can't get uh, a good reading what happened. It just kills whatever it is that you need to get from there. So they did a forensic hair analysis on me. And I'm just going to read to you what the doctor um, wrote. Please. To the court. And it's... It says, I have received lab reports which indicate very high amounts of several heavy metals on her hair analysis, consistent with toxicity, possibly induced by poisoning. These abnormalities include a mercury level which is 60 times the reporting limit, selenium 69 times the limit, antimony 49 times the limit, lead 280 times the limit, bismuth 40 times the limit, and most disturbing barium at 2,750 times the limit. The symptoms she described, which were present at the time of her psychiatric hospitalization in January and thought to be psychotic in nature were consistent with toxicity due to barium or perhaps mercury. So we finally found out the culprit, what had happened and what he did. Um, and then we look at when did he do all this? I believe after we did the divorce, he started putting this poison, which could be found in rat poisoning. He put it slowly in my coffee. And that's why I was getting sick and the aches and pains every day. And he was doing it slowly so that I, um, you don't notice it, right? Right. But then... I threw him a curve when I decided that I need to go to Egypt. He wasn't planning on this. And he only had a certain time in the house. And if I leave to Egypt, they may find out what's going on with me there, or I, it would stop the process. And now he has to start over again, but he won't have time at the house. So he had to finish me off that night. Yeah. That's what he had to do. And I believe he put everything, whatever the rest of the package in the food that night. And it must have been in the rice. And I think it's in the rice because, uh, and not in the beans casserole because it takes a long time to make the beans casserole. It's a complicated process. So I can see him making that for him and Colleen and me, we're gonna eat from it, but he must have baked a small pot of rice for me with all the rat poisoning or poison in them. Now you mentioned about the Holy Spirit and eating the rice and the yogurt. For the longest time, I didn't understand why the Holy Spirit took the time to tell me, put the yogurt on the rice. Like, why? And people would say, well, maybe because of the acidity, maybe because of it will coat your stomach, you know, different analysis. But it was finally revealed to me several years ago that putting the yogurt on my rice was the only way I was going to finish that whole bowl of rice. And God 
needed me or wanted me or planned for me to go through this episode, to go through this encounter. He could have stopped it any time. He didn't have, he could have said, don't eat the rice. Instead, you didn't have appetite. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have an appetite. He could have stopped the whole thing, but no, he needed me to encounter this because literally, Daniel, it was only when I was paralyzed and my eyes were shut that I could see what this man is all about. I was, like I said, addicted to him. He was a brilliant sociopath, brilliant. And everybody was fooled. And this was going to be the only way that I was going to see who he is and encounter this beautiful blessing that I did encounter. So that's why he told me, eat the rice, eat the put the yogurt on the rice. And I finished it. And it was good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unbelievable because uh, many times in our lives, we believe that everything that happens that's not that we think is not good it's not from God, it's something. But actually, we need to go through some experiences in life that are very important to us. And sometimes these experiences are not good, good for, from, from the end of our ego, from the end of ourselves, it's not good. But it's good for God because, because we are learning, because we are growing for many, many different reasons. And you see, uh, in this case, it's very interesting because uh, the Holy Spirit made you eat more and not less rice in this situation to make you go through it. <laughs> and uh, that's why uh, Sam did, uh, was not surprised for what was right. happening that night. And uh, everything has a reason. Everything has a purpose in this world. Everything. And, and so... Uh, sorry, Daniel, and it was the most amazing experience. Like, I would eat that rice and poison again if it will make me encounter what I encounter. Encount, you know, like we talk about death and people think, oh, my God, it's so scary. It's darkness. It's, you know, people are scared to die alone. Um, but death was not anything scary at all. It was actually a beautiful, amazing encounter. Amazing. Uh, it was like we say, when the spirit of death is on you, like when I knew that I was going to die, I couldn't get up and uh, say goodbye to Colleen or anything. I wasn't paralyzed at the, the time. But when it, the spirit of death is on you, you're, you can't move, you can't do anything. But it, to me, he's the spirit of light because he is that spirit that comes when we are dying and he must have revealed himself to me because I was dying. And he had to coach me to get me through the torture that I was going to um, encounter. And his presence made it all worthwhile. It didn't matter what was happening to my body. It didn't. It didn't matter that I was getting betrayed. It didn't matter that this guy who was my love for, and, and the greed, none of that mattered because the presence of the Holy Spirit was just magnificent. And I tell parents that, you know, there's a lot of parents that have lost children to a horrific method of death. And it... Um, they live life reliving their child's encounter or uh, reliving or uh, thinking of what had happened to their kids, like what were the kid, their child feeling at the end? They must have been scared. They must have been terrified. They were in pain. I wasn't there for them. And the guilt that kills a father or a mother just repicturing or reliving the last moments in their child's life. And I told them there was no fear. There, the Holy Spirit comes, reveals himself. And to children, of course, because who am I that he reveals himself to me and comforts me? So I can just for sure when a child is undergoing 
horrible things that we have in this world, the comforter is there, coaching him, holding his hand, loving him or her. And that child is not thinking about what happened because that beauty of the spirit of God is just amazing. It's, it's, it, it's so hard to explain. It's just beyond, beyond amazing. And um, I believe people will feel it on their deathbed you know, and maybe they'll remember me and they'll say, this woman, she told us <laughs> when when they're dying and then he reveals himself and you realize how beautiful death is. It's sad for the ones who are letting you go. It's sad for the ones staying behind, but the one who goes to the other side, it's it's tremendous joy that you can't, you can't contain. It's just amazing experience. This message of yours now is is huge is really beautiful because there are many many parents and fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers suffering thinking on exactly this how they lost their loved ones what happened if they suffer if it had pain uh, uh, thinking the worst things about the moment of death and what you 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 experienced and you bring back to us to learn is that no no death is a process as you said death is a process uh and we have comfort and we are never alone we are never never alone so yeah so it for sure must come for many many people now that had have this situation and are thinking about their loved ones. So don't worry. Don't worry because God yeah. is bigger. Had, oh, absolutely. He had them, each one of them. When he tells me he's in every detail of my life, that, to me, that, that was the biggest thing of this experience, is to know that he's in every little detail of our life. Now, when we're dying, he reveals himself. But when we're living, he's there, but he doesn't impose himself on us. He's, he's just there as a guide and a counselor only if you acknowledge him and start, you know, utilizing him. I feel he's a power that we don't utilize. So he's become my best buddy. He's become my soulmate because really, you know, we always say our husbands, our wives, our loved ones are our soulmate. No, he is your soulmate. You have yeah. the soul that God gave us and he gave us a piece of him, his spirit. And they, he's the one that knows it all. When that night uh, with him, he kept answering a lot of questions I had without me asking again. He knew my thoughts, he knew everything. And he was pacifying me. He kept <laughs> telling me, oh, this happens because of this and this happens because of this. And it made so much sense. And everybody time. has a reason. Yeah. Because of that, because of that, because of that, we don't think this through our lives, but everything has a reason, has now a cause, an effect. So everything is linked together. Absolutely. It's We're not alone. We're not alone. And you can have your best buddy with you always. He reminds me of things. He, he just does. Of course, he doesn't talk to me like he did when... I was dying, but he's there. He smiles at me through numbers. I have a number, my number with him, he's 222. Two, two. So I see that number. I could be looking at ledgers of numbers, you know, as an accountant, you get, and I would see that 222, two, two, and I would see that 222 two, two, anywhere. And I know he's smiling on me. And just as he is with me, he can be with everybody. Like he's- The signal there. you have. That's the signal you have. It's amazing. It's, Everything has a reason. Your experience had a reason. You were pushed to it in some sense by the Holy Spirit, let's say. And uh, what would be, in short, what would be that you think is the main reason why everything happened to you? Because, well, you had many, many lessons, different lessons, like you, you saw your father, your mother, your sister, you understood many different things. You, it calmed down your heart. Many, many things happened. But what do you think was the main purpose 
for you to have this experience? One thing was I was in shackles with the, and I didn't know it. Okay. So he opened my eyes, like I said, to see what, what was happening in my life. But the most, I think the most important experience is the revelation to know that I have a friend, the Holy Spirit with me in every detail and come back and know that truth. Like that is something we're all going to find out, but it's going to be too late, right? With me, right. and that's why he said, you're going to be my ambassador. I thought about it later. It's not the ambassador of God, the Father, or Jesus. They have enough ambassadors. People talk about God and Jesus and a lot of different uh, powers there. Uh, but you don't hear about the Holy Spirit. And the crazy thing, it's in the Bible. It's all over. Like if you take John, Jesus everywhere, he says, I have to go to the Father so I can send you the comforter who's going to be with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to leave you as orphanages. He said it. And he's up there with, with uh, Jesus is up there. We Jesus is not down here. It was interesting that I encountered the Holy Spirit till the last minute till I couldn't breathe anymore. Then it was Jesus that was escorting me to heaven. And the Holy Spirit wasn't on the other side. He's our counselor, comforter on earth that God gave. You know, and we don't utilize. We exactly. don't use. And and to me, that's the most amazing blessing that I have. It's not about coming back and living. No, it's coming back and knowing that truth and telling others about it that we don't have to wait on our deathbed like I was at 49 and feel ashamed that we have a beautiful being that can help us and like i said he doesn't impose he's just he's an amazing sweet just sweet character being i can describe him i don't understand it it's like you know we can't see our soul right but you know you have a soul the same thing with the spirit you have him you can't understand it but he's a being he's he's he's, he's amazing so no, <laughs> so i'm yeah. blessed encountered him for just, sure it's just uh just amazing blessing and um it's I'm, I'm so thankful like there's no words to describe and i and i'm not special i'm nothing and it's anybody can encounter that on earth but also giving comfort to parents who lost a loved one i think i need yes. to start Talking. You know, this event happened about 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And I would speak here and there. You know, I published a book, but I never marketed it. I just had to write the story. Uh, I kept waiting for God to send me somebody to write. I'm an accountant. How am I going to write a book? And then he said, no, child, you're going to write it. So I started writing it. And it took four months and I wrote a book. And then it got published. But I didn't do anything. With it. I, it wasn't... I said, you know, this is your story. You want it out there, you'll put it in the hands of the right people. But I'm not going to do anything about it. And I speak here and there, but this year somehow I was really convicted that I need to speak. I need to share. I need to share as much as possible. Let others know that they're not alone, that we have a beautiful partner, so when women are alone, when people are feeling lonely, they can they can acknowledge and utilize that. And it's a great connection. It's a great connection. I just, I don't know how else to say it. It's just beautiful. You, well, you wrote the, the book, My Sweet Encounter with Death. Uh, amazing book. And uh, in the description of this video, you will find a link for this book. I recommend everyone to read because it has a lot of details that will for sure surprise you even more. 
And uh, for sure, the experience that you had was not only, it was mainly for you, maybe, but not only for you, it was for you, as you told us, to share. And it's very important because when you share the story by here in this video or by your book, or any way you share this story, you are sharing faith, you are sharing hopeness, you are sharing happiness, you are connecting people with God. So it's a, a very important, like ambassador, and you are now an ambassador. <laughs> Whether you like or not, you are an ambassador now, and that's important. And that's I'm pretty sure that one, was one reason why, one strong reason why you were there, you had this, witnessed all of this, to be here, to tell us. And uh, what would you tell us in one phrase in, for everyone that, as us, that never had this experience, what would you tell in short words? He's in every little detail of your life. That's it. Can't imagine, but that's it. Every detail. He knows the hairs on your head. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. So that's the most beautiful. Beautiful. And uh, before we finish, I want to make you two more questions. I know you're tired, probably. No, number, that's okay. But it's more <laughs> a very short answer, too. But I cannot let it go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. Yes. One of them is uh, about Jesus. Because okay. uh, you told me before, I knew that, but I, I believe you didn't uh, mention that now. So I wanted to say, uh, explain a little better why you, you saw Jesus. You saw that Jesus was not a, a handsome man, nah? not because we all think Jesus as a, the most beautiful man that have ever existed as a body, we're saying as flesh nah? and blood body. Uh, but no, you said he was very ordinary. He was even almost ugly. <laughs> almost you were like ordinary. Almost you were saying, "Okay, I, I was ashamed to think that he's not beautiful, like a, a handsome." Uh, why is that? You know, I found out later after I saw him, that in the Old Testament, I can't remember where, in Isaiah or something, it dis Isaiah prophesied about Jesus and he said something about he's not, he's something about he's not handsome. Okay, he, not, uh, but I don't have the verse. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because if Jesus 2,000 years ago had showed up, with the beautiful blue eyes and the handsome man he is, with a lot of women who are broken and lonely, and there was so much going on back then, they would have been attached to him as a body, as a human, not his godliness, his the faith in him. But he touched everybody through faith, through his beauty that was inside. But if he was a beautiful man walking around, he would have stumbled a lot of people. And that's not God's intention to stumble us. And imagine falling in love with Jesus in a bad way. It doesn't make sense. So it's God's wisdom that he did it that way. And uh, that's all I can see is that's, that's what he is. He's beautiful but not the beauty that we think of in a man to get attracted as a, an attraction, no. Thank you, no, I wanted you to share this with us too because I believe it's another lesson, another important lesson because uh, really if uh, we confuse like nah, the, the, the passion yeah. with nah, the beautiful we had inside are different things and for sure it would yeah, if he was pretty, pretty handsome, it would bring jealousy for many men. It would yeah. bring passion from many women. So right. it wouldn't work out. And everything has a reason. Everything has a purpose. So yeah. just to show it again, it again, even with the life of Jesus, 
the same situation. Curiosity, okay, just a curiosity. Maybe I will share this curiosity with others or not. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever asked you that, but you said that when you were in heavens, you saw, first of all, a, a beautiful sky, different place with a lot of love, uh, joy, etc., etc. But you saw animals. You saw animals with wings. And you didn't say birds. You said animals. Right. So it's very, uh, uh, I, I mean, I... I'm asking you so we can figure out, we can have an idea of all the variety that this universe has. Mm -hmm. So what what were them? Were similar to what? Were beautiful, were not beautiful? How were they? How were these animals, these winged animals? If you could you tell know, us a little bit. They, they are, I saw a movie, Avatar, that came out after my event by the end of that year. And when they were riding, I don't know if you've seen Avatar, the first one, they were riding over these beautiful animals and flying with them. I don't know, they called it dragons maybe, but they weren't, they're not dragons. They're just big animals. And if you notice the colors were beautiful. When I saw Avatar, I wondered if the person who did it had a near death. To, <laughs> right away, I thought to myself, he saw something because they were very similar to that. Animals you don't see on earth, but huge and flying and the colors are magnificent. Just. They were big, they were small. No, they were big animals. They were big animals. They're big animals. They were mm -hmm. flying. I don't know how you fly, <laughs> but they, yes. like, they're not birds. Not they that were... for us to think how wonderful is this universe and many different dimensions and how there are many, many more things that we as a human can, can even yeah. think about it. No. Very, very good. It, yeah, well, it's hard to, I don't know what it was, but it was something I've never seen before. Good. So. Okay, and I, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you again uh, we, I really appreciate it for this opportunity to have you here uh, in our channel to share all this amazing experience with many, many lessons. And I, I say to everyone here, uh, listen again and again and again, because if you pay attention on the details, you will find many, many, many different lessons and amazing, amazing things about the spiritual world. So, uh, Anna, if you want to... Thank you again. And if you want to say your last words, please. It's a blessing to be here, Daniel, and to reach your uh, viewers. Like I said earlier with you, uh, I'm trying now to share more about the story so people who cannot buy the book or they're anywhere in the world, I know you can get it, but, you know, videos and they can, you know, know what happened. Um, because, again, it's not about buying the book. It's about... And it's not about the story. It's not about the death and the murder. It's about the encounter, with the Holy Spirit. That's that's the message. That's what's in my heart. So Perfect. thank you for giving me this opportunity to reach your audience and viewers. It's a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you always. Thanks. Bye guys. Bye.